All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in today. God is good. Boy, I'm I'm excited. Open your Bibles to Judges chapter 2. God is so good. I believe that uh, I believe in the prophetic expression of scripture and I believe God is just speaking clearly, loudly to us today, to the church, me personally, and I believe to you all too as we heed the word of God. So I just want to pray for the Holy Spirit to illuminate our minds to the word today. Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus, your Holy Spirit of God that was promised to come if you went back to the Father to illuminate our minds, illuminate our minds to the prophecy of scripture, to the words of God, to the revealed nature, to the heart of God. And then Lord, I pray that you will empower us to move and to make positive choices and decisions and make change. And that's our hope. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Judges chapter 2. Let me read to you again. We had the scripture last week, but I want to build on what the Holy Spirit is saying. Now the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bachim. And he said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land which I have sworn to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Now, little side note. You've got to remember this angel messenger here who speaks with authority, we believe is a pre-manger, what they call a theophany, an appearance of God or a Christophany, an appearance, a pre-manger appearance of God in the Old Testament. And you have to remember because anytime you see the article, the definite article, the, the angel of the Lord instead of an angel of the Lord, right? It, it's specifying a unique being separate from the other angels, an angel with authority, an angel that identifies himself with God and exercises the responsibilities of God. So it's pretty clear, my mind, conclusion that this angel is a manifestation of God, Jesus Christ, the Word, in the beginning was with God, right? He pre-existed prior to the manger, coming to earth, engaging with humankind. And we see that some 12 times in the Old Testament. Now, Jesus here declares himself to be the existent one before Abraham in John 8, 58. So, so it's logical that he would be active and manifest in the world. All right, look at verse 2. And as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed me. And this is that question that just looms. It has for the last three weeks. What is this you have done? What is this you have done? Verse 3, we'll come back to that. Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, speaking of the enemies of the land, but they will become as thorns in your sides, and their gods, their gods, what are their gods? Demon principalities. What are false gods? Demon strongmen, demon principalities. Those demons will be a snare to you. Verse 4, when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the sons of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. Don't we all cry after the fact? So they named that place Bachim. Bachim literally means weeping. And there they sacrificed to the Lord. Now let me just list for you what we just read so the message is clear. Okay, get this into your spirit. Jesus comes from Gilgal, which is representative of all the glory, the power, the deliverance, the promises of God to Bachim, to the place where they found themselves, this place of weeping. This place of backsliddenness, you could say. This place to where literally the enemies of the land, because they failed to drive them out, now these demonic influences are plaguing them and pulling them away from their God. The people were told by Jesus that he would never break his covenant with them. Verse 1, then they're reminded of his commandment to tear down the altars of the foreign gods of the land, which they didn't do completely. In other words, God reminds them, look, you failed the test. You didn't do what I told you to do. Verse 2 which was a command going all the way back to Moses, right? Then they are challenged to respond to their lack of obedience like any father would speak to a child. What is this you have done? In other words, the implication from silence is this, this question is literally a rhetorical question that they were to respond to themselves. What is this you have done? Boy, I hear the Holy Spirit saying, speaking loudly to me, to the church today with those words. Then Jesus makes a very important statement to them which reflects the revealed nature of God's heart. Look at verse 3. Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they will become as thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a snare to you. Their gods will be a snare to you. Wow. 
people then lift up their voices and wept, and they sacrificed to the Lord. If you remember last Sunday, I told you to, to refuse to obey the Lord or to pick and choose that we saw this so clearly with the Truth Project. We've seen this so clearly this year. To pick and choose what is right or wrong according to your own wisdom, right? Be it convenience or military strategy, just like the, the people of Israel did with not driving out the inhabitants of the land, right? That is, in fact, to make a covenant with the present world system or culture that you presently live in. That's what that means. And when that happens, we end up with a half-hearted discipleship, a, a no more than a religious system, not an Acts 2 church, but we, but, but, we, but we only know the history of God, and we don't command, right? We don't command the future promises of God by faith when that happens. In other words, we can become a whitewashed, community, culturally defined, religious system, not a relationship, faith-built relationship with God. The author here continues, possibly Samuel, as I said, verses 7 through 9, he kind of recaps, Joshua dies, he's 110 years old. Now look at verse 10. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which we had done for Israel. Now you've got to, man, come on, if you circle in your Bibles or you write things down, you gotta, you got to take note of this scripture right here because this is a stark reminder, verse 10, that any generation that simply follows a human leader, anointed of God or not, with their, without their own conviction and vision by faith through the word of God, will soon fade from glory to, to no more than a fate memory of who God was and not who God is. Wow. In the same fashion, any generation only flows with the revival movement, yet isn't part of the revival. In other words, they're just, they just stay part of the crowd for the hoopla, right? And they don't become part of the change. They too will soon fade away from the glory of God. That's just the way it is. In other words, going back to the nation of Israel here, it's not that they didn't remember the stories of Moses, but that's all it was, was a story. Look, when I read the Acts 2 church, in Acts chapter 2, the power of God, the anointing. And we in the assemblies of God, we believe in the fullness of God. We believe in the inspiration of all scripture. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Look, when I read that, I have to own that. I have to, I have to not just read of history, but, I, but, but it needs to be assimilated to my heart so I can believe by faith for today and for our future. But that's with Joshua, right? You go back to the nation of Israel, it's not that they didn't remember the stories of Moses and Joshua and the supernatural hand of God to get them to where they were. It's just that their history wasn't binding upon them. In other words, it was read to them, but they never bound their hearts to it. Why? Because that's all it was. It was history of someone else. A history of head knowledge wasn't personally owned. Look, the Bible can just be history of somebody else and not our personal, powerful, right, doctrinal, uh, Rules for all faith, life, and conduct, and promises. Wow. I wonder how much of the book of Acts is personally owned by the church today. Not a lot, I will tell you that. Because a lot of people have said, oh no, no all that crazy wild stuff, that, that ended with the, the apostles. Well, that means it once was, but it's not binding upon my heart. Well, let me tell you, ask for me in my house. And if you disagree with me, God bless you. That, that There's no argument between you and I. I'm not saying I'm better than you. I'm, I can only speak for myself. I am bound to the, to the book of Acts. I believe that history is my faith and my hope and my future and my glory. Come on. All scripture, as far as that goes. Again, listen carefully. Because the question posed to them by this angel of the Lord Jesus, what is this you have done? It still rings forth with a conviction to any generation who has allowed the false gods of their time to enter into their land and culture. Folks, only time can answer that question for us. The scriptural account here in Judges answers the question for Israel, verses 11 through 13. Look at it. I'll put it on the screen for you. Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed themselves down to them. Thus they provoked the Lord to anger. So they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtoreth. Wow. Come on, somebody. Oh. 
By the way, I'm not feeling good today. Pray for me. I probably a good thing or I'd be yelling and screaming and jumping and shouting. <laughs> but I tell you, my heart is just touched by this. In other words, listen, by not heeding their prophetic past and by not remembering the words spoken to them through their father, prophet Moses, they literally became witnesses against themselves. That's what they said when Joshua commanded them, look, choose for yourselves who you will serve. And they said, we will serve the God. And Joshua said, well, you're going to be a witness to yourself. In other words, Right? The proof is in the pudding, how you live. They, they hailed. Let me, just, let me just put this on. I wasn't going to do this, but let me put this up for you. Listen to what Moses told him. Deuteronomy 20, verse 16 through 18. Only in the cities of these peoples that the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance, you shall not leave anything alive that breathes. But you shall utterly destroy them, the Hittite and the Amorite, the Canaanite and the Perizzite. Hevite and the Jebusite, as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that, look at this, so that they may not teach you to do according to all their detestable things which they have done for their gods. Again, little g, demonic, demon, gods, so that you would sin against the Lord your God. Goes right back to their choice, right? Started right out with Judah. Who should go up? You go up. Given the land, Canaanites into your hands. So they take Simeon. Then they go into the land. They partially drive out some of the people and put them into, subject them to slave labor. I mean, we just looked at this. Compromise, 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 compromise. Some of them just move in there and crowd it around the Canaanites. Well, listen, anytime you don't do what God says by these guys, just watch this. They didn't drive them out completely. So they're making a covenant with the people they leave. Why? Because they're demonic gods. Their principalities have permission to stay in the land. And then those demons attack them. And what do they do? They fall away from their gut. Their choice to live side by side with this depraved Canaanites meant a corruption of their spiritual lives as the people of Israel began to imitate the wicked practices of them, which included worship of deities referred to using names as Baal and Ashtoreth. Baal was the god of life and fertility, and it was a multitude of things. And Ashtoreth, this ancient Semitic goddess of the moon, of sexuality, and from the real God to these false gods. Amazing. Now, verse 17 is a key to what the Holy Spirit wants to show us. Look in your Bibles, Judges 2.17. Let me put it on the screen for you. Yet, they did not listen to their judges, so God raised up judges, this generation falls away and they don't know the Lord, so God raises up judges. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they played the harlot. This is the NASB, the New American Standard Updated Bible I'm reading out of. They played the harlot after other gods and bowed down themselves to them. They turned aside quickly from the way in which their fathers had walked and obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do as their fathers. Generation removed, they didn't do as their fathers. And I have it underlined and in blue for you on the screen. They played the harlot. Now, let me just show you this. The complete Jewish Bible translates this a little bit different. They did not pay attention to their judges, but made whores, whores of themselves. Right? They played the harlot. They made whores of themselves. The NIV, here's a shout out to Paula, but I like the way the NIV translates this. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves. Wow, they played the harlot. <laughs> they made whores of themselves. They prostituted themselves. Folks, to me, this, this verse is a wake-up call for the church today. And I believe the prophetic word for us, at least here at Maytown, in that, look, we believe that this angel appearance is Jesus himself saying, what is this you have done? We believe that. We also know from Scripture that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, according to Hebrews 13, 8. Have it on the screen for you. And again, as the Apostle Paul warned us, now these, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, now these things happened to them. In other words, history happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction. In other words, history is to be bound upon your heart as instructive upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Now that's just a sample. So here's the million dollar question to you. 
How can we not receive this word as a warning for us today? And they prostituted themselves. They made whores of themselves. They played the harlot. And how did they do that? How is it that God called them a harlot, a prostitute, a whore? How is that? It's because they mixed the things of God with the things of the pagan nation, the pagan world around them. Please get this. They mixed the thing, things of their culture, the influences of their culture, right? With the things of their God. And God says they played the harlot, they made whores of themselves, and they prostituted themselves. Wow. Wow, wow. Somebody say wow. Somebody say wow. In other words, watch this. It challenges us with the question, what is this you have done? Look, it was given for them contextually in real time for them to reflect upon. But just as, as it was given to them, I received that today to do prophetically because Jesus Christ is the same. This is revealed nature of God. And if God tells them to self-reflect, then I can't help but read that and self-reflect. What have you done? How much of the world has, have you allowed to pollute you with your true faith, your true walk with God? In other words, if they prostituted themselves with the demonic influence that surround them, have we done the same? It was posed as a self-reflective question. I can't get past it. And I look in my own life and I say, yeah, boy. Yeah, boy. Why? Because there's still things of the world, things that I gaze upon, things that I think about, things of, of, the, of the culture around us that we just allow or tolerate. Look, it's not that we're to leave but it's that it, we, we tolerate it and we accept it. We should never accept it. We don't need to move away and, and hide in a hole, but we need to be the DNA, a light on the hill that, that is a positive influence against that stuff. Yet it's so easy through television or movies or, or laws in the land to just prostitute yourself. Whew. Look, I understand this message is very striking and it's provocative in its imagery with these words. You've played the harlot. You have whored yourself. You have prostituted yourselves. But I didn't write the message. God did. God wrote it. And it stands. So here's what we know or what we don't know. The same demons that were allowed to stay in a land that weren't driven out then... Right? Where do they go? They don't die. They're still in operation. They just retool their schemes to fit the next culture. That's why we're warned against the spiritual powers of wickedness, forces of evil in the heavenly realms. They just retool it. They just tool it up to make it look applicable to our culture. Prostitutes then and now often are people whose lives are out of control who are desperate and who are giving themselves without getting any real pleasure or love in return. Plus the use of the word prostituted here tells us that when we serve an idol or when we come into an intense relationship with it, within which it uses us and doesn't truly care to us, care for us, is abhorred by God. Again, just listen carefully. When this happens, we become completely vulnerable to it, little more than a slave to it. And, and this scriptural image also tells us that God sees all sin, all idolatry as adultery. And that he does not merely want us to know and obey him as a citizen obeys a king or merely, merely follow him as a sheep follows a shepherd. No, but rather he wants us to know him and love him as a wife loves his husband. That's why he uses the imagery of prostitution here. That's one of the reasons why in both the Old and New Testament, God calls himself our bridegroom. Bridegroom because as a marriage is exclusive legal commitment, yes. But not only that, a real marriage involves deep, intimate, reflective, selfless love and commitment. It wasn't happening. Israel, according to the context and imagery here, had become no more. And I love this. And this is what I titled this message, a married prostitute. I thought about that. I thought really deep about that in my own relationship with the Lord. Am I a married prostitute? What is the image of a married prostitute? What does that speak to you? Here's what it speaks to me. Just a natural, cultural, identifiable, 
identifying terms, it would be this, a married woman who is married and comes home, lives with her husband, but goes out as a job or part-time and prostitutes herself with another man for money, for pleasure, for lack of self-worth. It doesn't matter. A married prostitute. So let me close with this. The Hebrew language, in the Hebrew language, there are two common words for prostitute. Kiddushah, Kiddushah, which speaks of a, of, of a prostitute that is dedicated um, or consecrated, set apart as a temple prostitute, a Kiddushah. And there, then there's another word, Zanach. Zanach simply meant an ordinary prostitute or a loose woman asleep around. <laughs> Here in Judges, Israel is called the Zanach, which means a type of prostitute who is loose, loose with serving God, loose with serving false gods of the Canaanites, loose with all of the commitment to know one thing literally, but as everything just, she wasn't a wholehearted worshiper of God and really wasn't a wholehearted worshiper of demonic influence, just asleep around. You know, one of the most vivid pictures, and I don't have time today or in this message to go to um, Hosea to pick this up, but in chapters 1 through 3 of Hosea, you have this imagery of, of what God is doing through Gomer and this prostitute. And he says, look, remove the adulterous look from her face and the unfaithfulness from between her breasts, Hosea 2.2. 2. As she burned incense to the Baal, she decked herself with rings and jewelry and went after her lovers, but, but me she forgot, declares the Lord, verse 13. Then God tells his prophet Hosea to marry the prostitute Gomer so that their marriage can serve as a picture of what God will do for his, pe for his people and how they will respond. Now, without getting too far and wide into that, this, this dynamic here in Hosea shows us why God responds to his people when they follow other gods and, and serve and worship them, as we saw in Judges 2.19, but becoming angry with them. Meaning his anger is not opposed to his love, but it's an expression of his love. In other words, as he loves his people and cares about his relationship with them, he responds with right anger when they turn from him and prostitute themselves. You can just say that his anger is that of an innocent, jilted lover demonstrating the love of a wonderfully forgiving husband. Folks, this is a relationship God wants us to enjoy with him. That's why he told Hosea, I say to her, you shall stay with me for many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man, so I will also be toward you. It's a powerful message. This is a relationship God wants us to enjoy with him. And the only relationship which will avoid idolatry is a passionate, personal relationship with love. Let me ask you this, how much do you love God, right? Well, I think all of us that are born again would say, oh, I love him with all my heart. But do we? Is our heart divided? Look, I didn't write this message. God did. Some of you might love him because you just want, don't want to go to hell or because you're, you were called by the bridegroom to love him and serve him only. But you don't know what only means because, look, it's not our fault. We live in this culture in this time that's so polluted. It's so diluted with, with compromises. People lift up the name of God in government and everywhere, but it's, it's just a name. It could mean any God. I don't know how many people run across, ah, I believe in a higher power, but there are many ways to God. Besides, that Old Testament stuff, that's not relevant anymore. We've evolved past all of that junk. I don't know. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forevermore. Jesus appears in the Old Testament. Jesus comes to earth, Emmanuel, God with us at Christmas. Jesus lives and dies in a sense back to the Father. I don't see how any of that is irrelevant for today. And if this is the revealed nature of God, if this was the challenge, then as Paul says, look, these things are written for us, for our instruction. For our instruction. We have to get this. It goes back to the question, what is this you have done? Look, what is Christmas all about? Let me just throw that out in closing. Right? What is Christmas? We do Christmas Island here at I pointed to it. We do Christmas Island here at Natown. What is Christmas all about? Have we prostituted ourselves with trees and Santa and 
all of the other junk that goes along with it. What about Easter? What about eggs and bunnies and stuff? Look, I don't, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus, but I have a tree. I do this and that. We do this. Okay, look, I'm not talking about being legalistic. But what is the bottom line through the eyes of God? How much prostitution do we have within us? It's an amazing self-reflective question. Look, only you can answer that. God answered it for Israel, and they paid the price. History will tell about the church today, but I will tell you this. When I read the book of Acts, when I read the New Testament and the Old Testament, it's history, but it's binding upon my heart. This word out of Judges is binding upon my heart because it's not just about other people. It's about people who serve the same God that I serve. And if Jesus showed up to them, the angel of Yahweh, Elohim, he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, then I have to heed this word, and I have to self-reflect. I'm going to do that. I'm going to self-reflect this Christmas, and I'm going to look deep inside. What has this ship done? How much of this world have I prostituted into my faith, prostituted into my daily walk with God? I tell you what, social media, boy, it can be addictive. How much time do we spend on our phones or on Facebook or on Marketplace or OfferUp or Craigslist or any of that stuff? Those are the challenges for me because I'm always working on my boat and looking for this and that and fiddle-faddle. A lot of time spent when I could be, right, spending it more in the Word. Just a thought. Let me just pray. Father, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus. This Word rings home. And I pray right now, Holy Spirit, not only have you touch me and convict me, but touch and convict everyone listening with the words, what is this you have done? What have we done? How much God and world do we have mixed together? Do we even know what's there? Are we convicted of it, but we just can't? When you say, I can't, it literally means you won't because the power of God is there to deliver anyone from anything. Father, touch us. I don't want this Christmas to go by without there being just the supernatural of God demonstrated in my life. I want to draw closer to you. I want to hit this new year with such power and authority. It's going to be a building year for us at Maytown. We want to take the land, seize the land. We want you to lead us. We don't want you to follow us. We want to follow you, lead us. Our history, all of the acts of the apostles, that's, not, that's binding on my heart. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That's binding on my heart. I can overcome all things. I can rout out the enemies around me that have attacked me, that I've given permission permission to, to be there, to stay there from my past, that first 30 years of lust and running around and all that junk before I came to Christ. Those demons are still there wanting, knocking. They want to get back in. But I have the power to overcome. Father, I personally receive the word. I pray for everyone out there right now. If there's any prophetic, apostolic impartation, take this word to heart with the question, Holy Spirit, deliver the question, what is this you have done? And then touch us. Lord, you don't want to judge us and send us to hell. You want to save us. You want to redeem us. And it all started at Christmas when you came to earth. Emmanuel, God, with us. But we must choose to stay who we will serve, as Joshua said. Lord, I choose, I can do all things, and I will. And I pray for everyone listening to my voice. Everyone out there, if you need to come back to the Lord, just tell them, Lord, I've been backslidden, I'm sorry. I prostituted myself with the world. I, I confess that sin, I come back to you. Now, Holy Spirit, give me the power to overcome and lead me and guide me. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. I don't know if you can hear that over the mic, but I hear train. Maytown starts blowing its own. Yahoo! Yahoo! Yeah, yeah. God is good. God is good. Well, there's your Hosea passage. You can come back to that reference. I didn't show you that. We should pray for the offerings. We want to pray and seek the Lord and give Him our good gifts and offerings. You can do that at MaytownAG.com. Don't forget this Saturday, 9 to noon, coming up. We have a work party here. We will be finishing up pretty much, should have everything done, uh, short of just a nighttime light, lights and effects adjustment. 
And um, then Saturday night after Thanksgiving, away we go. We're going to light Christmas Island up. There'll be fireworks. There'll be a food court. There'll be caroling. It's going to be an awesome time. Mark your calendars. Set that day apart. Get here early. Five o'clock will start, but there'll be a food court. Come on down and be a part of what God wants to do. And let's not prostitute ourselves this Christmas. Let's, let's let that be a word for us, and I believe it is. What is this you have done? Self-reflect. Let God show you and then guide you. He, like, like he told Hosea, go out and marry Gomer and bring her into your house and love her. That's what God wants to do to us. He wants to restore us and lift us up. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here in person at 1030 on Sunday. God bless.